and it's red. So I guess that means we're good to go. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Harris. I am a senior web developer at Bryn Mawr College. Um, a lot of people don't know where Bryn Mawr is. Um, I have an introduction slide in a moment, so don't even worry about it. Um, but this is a uh, custom, or this is config pages for easy, um, easier uh, custom site navigation. Um, this is mostly a talk about fixing um, frictions in some of your development workflows rather than solving difficult technical problems. Um, I enjoy solving the difficult technical problems. It's the easy technical problems that cause problematic like workflows and, and friction and overhead um, that really annoy me. And so this is more of a talk about things that are not hard technically but are hard um, you know, but are hard logistically that just kind of make things a little bit more of a, a, a pain and how you can just reduce some of that pain. Um, I do not maintain the config pages module. It's just a module that I have found um, very useful. One of my favorite things about Drupal is that when you talk to other Drupal people, everyone has a couple of tools that they just rely on and could not imagine their workflow um, without and then other people have just never heard of those tools and so when you share those things you know everyone gets smarter um, i had not heard of this um, until um, Bryn Mawr has a drupal 10 website we migrated from drupal 7 a couple of years ago to drupal 9 and now drupal 10 um, you know, we work with a vendor named iFactory. They're based out of Boston. Um, they introduced us to this module, and I did not realize how I'd been living my life without it until they um, introduced it. Um, and then as I had talked to other people or Drupal, um, a lot of people haven't heard of this one. So if you have heard of this one, um, you're probably not going to learn much to it because it's a really elegant solution. Um, um, but, um, but if you have not heard of it, I, I think you're gonna, um, I, I hope uh, it can just cause some you know, um, easier time uh, around some of your more uh, painful development um, pain points. Um, quick introduction, um, basically I will tell you who I am. Again, uh, we'll go through some scenarios that I like to think of in order to ground the conversation, scenarios that um, we have to solve at Bryn Mawr scenarios that you know I'm sure some of you have had to solve at various times. I will discuss the config pages module. I'll do um, a very brief demonstration of the user interface. Um, talk about some key features. I'll talk a bit more about how Bryn Mawr uses uh, the config pages module, and I'll talk about some other features that I don't have time for in this talk, and then a couple of uh, final thoughts. Um, so who am I? I yeah, I'm Michael Harris. I'm a student developer at Bryn Mawr College. Bryn Mawr is a historically women's liberal arts college um, in uh, suburban Philly. We're right next door to Villanova. Um, so if you know, you know that terrible part of you know the the interstate, you know fighting traffic to get there. Uh, the campus is lovely. Uh, we're about 1,800 students, about 1,350 undergrads, about 450 grad students. Um, historically, women's college um, in the Quaker tradition. Um, I like working in higher education because it means I get to walk around a really beautiful campus for work. Um, if you're ever in the area, you know, send me an email. Um, I'll buy a cup of coffee. Um, but yeah, that's who, who I am. Um, cool. So I want to talk about a couple of scenarios that um, you know we face. I've adapted these a little bit to make them more general. Um, I'm sure you've maybe faced uh, some of them from time to time, and you've found solutions. And the solutions you have found have probably, maybe they've been great, but maybe they've been a little more frustrating than you intend. Um, the first scenario is um, you need to update an email list. Uh, your website sends um, emails to a manually curated list of employees from time to time. Um, one day, as employees do, uh, an employee you know leaves the employer, they retire, they get a better job, they win the lottery. Um, but you need to remove them from the email list. Um, and then a few months later, their replacement is hired, and you need to update the email list um, yet again. And you have this as your you know Drupal solution, um, not the most complicated technical problem, just updating the list of recipients of your email. Um, and you can imagine what the workflow might happen. As the IT department, as the web developer, you probably uh, it's, it's not your job to like hire and fire these people or to throw the retirement party. You just get you know, an email or a ticket whenever a change needs to be made. 
So let's imagine how you might you know, solve this problem. Um, one solution, which is a pretty bad, is just to hard code the email addresses in your, um, in your module, in your code, in your custom code. Um, it's it's bad idea to hard code things in your code for a lot of reasons, but it's worth thinking about why that's annoying from a workflow perspective. So um, your communications office, in our instance that I'm thinking of, you know, the Bryn Mawr College of Communications, um, they sort of own the business process for this email um, this email list, and so they have to submit a ticket into our ticketing system, um, and then they have to wait for the ticket to get resolved. Um, and it's just a black box until you know we do what we have to do. And then on the web development side, the actual web development to change this hard-coded list would not be difficult, um, but there's a lot of overhead. You have to read the ticket. You have to sort of room and triage the ticket and put the ticket in your, um, in your sprint, in your JIRA. You have to assign it your story points. You have to um, assign it to a developer. You have to merge it into your sprint branch. It has to go through code review. It has to go through QA. You have to rerun all of your automated tests. You have to schedule it for a deployment. Um, the deployment may not be as fast as um, the business process owner wants. Um, and that's just the one time, that's just when the one employee, you know, leaves the employer, um, you know, when their replacement is hired and the replacement needs to be added to the list, all of this has to happen again. All for about two to three seconds of development work. Um, it's just a lot of very annoying overhead for a very easy technical solution. Um, so that's why I would call this a bad solution. Like, it's not hard, but it's, it has a lot of friction around it. Um, an okay technical solution, since we're talking about Drupal, is you can sort of, you know, create your own configuration form. You can, you know, create your form, your form class. You can hand code all of your, um, you know, form elements. Maybe you have the plugins and VS Code to automatically look up the form elements for you, so it's not that hard to create the form. You create your submit handler, which saves the stuff to the configuration system. And so you tell your business process owner, hey, I've just created a form. You don't have to tell us when um, you know, this form gets updated. You can just go in and do it yourself. And that's cool. Your business owner is happy. They don't have to submit a ticket. Um, they don't have to wait for a deployment, um, so on and so forth. That's great. It's still painful on the developer because if you've created this custom form and you're using the config system in Drupal, you still have to watch out for these config changes. Like on your next deployment, you have to you know, check, has, is my configuration still in sync or has someone else changed this configuration? And if someone else has changed this configuration, you have to export it into your YAML and you have to commit the change and you have to make sure um, all of that stuff happens. If none of you have ever inadvertently overwritten a configuration that you didn't know was changed, um, that's great. Um, I have overwritten a configuration that I didn't know was changed. Um, and it was because we didn't want to have friction for you know, the site editor who just, they just wanted to update the value. They don't care about the configuration system. They don't care about the YAML. They don't care about um, making sure you export and commit all the stuff. They just want to be able to update the form. So it's a great solution for them, but it's a painful solution uh, for the web development team. Um, I also don't like writing configuration forms. It was very cool when I first did it. Um, it was not cool, you know, the 20th or 30th time that I did it. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's, that's what you have. And also, if you're writing your own custom forms, your form elements are probably going to be pretty basic. You know, our, our form widgets that we have in the field UI, those widgets can be pretty cool. But if you've ever had to write your own sort of, you know, Ajax handler, your own drag and drop, your own autocomplete from scratch, that's not very fun development. And, you know, your site editors, you know, they don't know what's contrib and what's custom. They don't know what the uh, field widget system is. They don't know that this isn't a field widget, that it's just a custom form. They want to know, you know, I've got the really cool entity autocomplete or the inline entity form over there. Why can't I have something similar over here? So you can either say, no, we can't do that, even though we did it in our node edit form, 
uh, we can't do it in this form because of technical reasons, which they don't really believe you, or you can try to and sort of um, waste a lot of time and the results probably won't be that good. So, you know, this is an okay solution for your business process owner, but it's an annoying solution for your web development team. Um, so that's sort of one of the scenarios that I want to have to think about as we're thinking about why config pages may be a good solution. Um, a second scenario, this is a much shorter slide, um, a one-off page, um, your home page, some other page. Um, you know, sometimes you just have a one-off page that isn't like any other page. Um, so what are your solutions for this? Um, you can create a, a dedicated content type. We've all created content types that intend to only have one instance of the content type. Um, and that's great for your, you know, content editors because they know how to edit content, they know how to edit nodes, this is just another node. But it's annoying, again, for the web developer because, you know, the web team, you have to either tell them, please don't create more than one instance of this node, or you have to download contributed modules or roll your own solution to enforce that there aren't multiple instances of this node, um, or, and you have to do a lot more effort um, configuring permissions, make sure that no one has permissions to delete the node. Um, when you onboard a new person, if you onboard a new web developer who has permissions to do everything, you have to tell them, hey, don't delete this node because it's the home page. Um, you know, you have to you know, make sure the node can't be unpublished. Um, you're taking a lot of the, the things that make nodes great are that you can create a lot of them and you can delete them and you can unpublish them and you have to undo all of that just for this one very specific use case. So that's a very annoying um, sort of approach. We've all done it, it, it works okay, but it's, there's friction there, right? Um, another solution is just to you know, roll a custom controller, and I love custom controllers, they're fine. Um, but if you want to have, um, you know, you don't, if it's a custom controller, you don't have to worry about getting deleted or unpublished. That's cool. Um, but the content editing experience might be bad or cumbersome. Maybe there's no content editing experience at all. Maybe the content editing experience is distributed um, in various places and various blocks, um, you know, so on and so forth. Maybe you have to, in one place, you rearrange your entity queue or your node queue, remember that great module. Um, and in another place, you have to, um, I don't know, you have to um, update some other block that's somewhere else. And none of these different editing experiences are in the same place. Um, maybe you create a block type for your home page and your um, custom controller just gets that block type, but then we're in the same situation we were with our content types. You have um, uh, you know, a block type for a single instance of content and they can create more of them, they can delete them. You're actually in no better place. So you know, whatever solutions we have, they work, but there's friction and sort of that friction is annoying. Um, so, you know, these are the two scenarios I want to sort of ground the discussion in um, because they're, I, I, I think things like this are pretty common um, and they're not hard technical problems, they're just annoying workflow problems. Um, so I want to talk about the config pages module, what it is, and then how it can help. Um, I tried to come up with my own description of the module, but I actually think the description from the maintainer on Drupal.org is pretty great, so I'm just going to read it to you. Um, just literally the first sentences at the top of the page. At some point, I was tired of creating custom pages using the menu and form API, writing tons of code just to have a page with an ugly form where a client can enter some settings, and as soon as a client wanted to add some interactions to the page, like drag and drop or Ajax, things start to get hairy. The same story was with the creation of a dedicated content type just to theme a single page like a home page and explaining why you can only have one node of this type or force it programmatically. Um, this module, the config pages module, provides a feudable entity that allows developers to create customizable and feature-rich configuration pages and place them where you like in the menu system. You are able to use the field API with fine widgets created by the community, so multi-values, drag and drop, autocomplete, file uploads, look pretty and just work out of the box. Um, so the config page module, it gives you, it, it, it's just a custom entity type 
Um, it's a content entity. It's odd that we call it config pages, but it's a content entity. And it enforces a singleton for you, and it doesn't carry all of the node stuff like the ability to be unpublished or you know deleted or or what have you. I mean, you can delete them, but it's you know not as obvious um, how to do it. Um, it's just it's it's a fieldable entity. Um, and you can use the fields because it's an entity. Um, instead of finding workarounds for the entity system, it just gives you the entity you want. And because it's a content entity, when those values change, um, they're not exported with you know Drush config export, and they're not overwritten with Drush config import. So um, you know your Content editors can change these values as much as they want, and you don't have to monitor them for config changes. Um, they can use fields like they're used to using fields in other places. Um, it's just kind of the way it, it, it's the proper implementation of something we've been trying to do improperly um, for a long time. Um, I'm going to give you a lightning fast demo of the user interface. It's going to be a really boring in, uh, demo because these are just normal entities. Um, and like, I, I, I feel really bad giving this talk because it's, it's, it's a really elegant module and it's so elegant you might mistake it for being boring. But it, it, I think it's just a really um, elegant uh, module. So I have, a, I, I spun up a quick local site. You go into structure, you go into config pages. I have a couple of config pages already. I'm gonna add a new config page um, this feels, again, like we're just adding a new bundle um, because we are just adding a new bundle. I will call it my config page. Uh, we can ignore some of these and maybe come back to them at the end. Um, but we've created our bundle. Um, we can add fields to our bundle. Uh, we'll, I'll just create a new field called my plain text field. And we configure it like we configure a field. And when we manage our form display, we pick our widget. Um, this is a plain text field, so there's just a text field widget. And then when we go back to structure, you know, config pages, um, and it, the a, a single entity of the bundle type has already been provisioned for us. We just edit it, and we type in our value. And our config page is now saved. And when you grow, go to export your, um, you know, your configuration in Drush, um, this value doesn't change. The bundle definition will be exported because it's a bundle definition, but the content won't be. So as soon as you set up the bundle for your site editor, um, you're done. You don't, you don't need to know how this uh, form changes. You don't need to know how, how, how these, this data change because it's not going to go into your config export. It's not going to get overridden in your config import. Um, it's, it, 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 it does the things that sort of both sides of, of the equation want to do um, with none of the friction um, that's caused. Um, any questions so far? Far? Yeah, go for it. Well, sure. This is great. What good is it? That's a great question. <laughs> um, so I'll show you. You're yeah. Great. You know you're that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question, so the question is, this is great, but what good is it? Um, so I will show how we solve the two problems that I mentioned, and then I will show how uh, we solve a couple of different problems as well. So back to our slides. Uh, slideshow. Great. Um, the key features, I'm going to talk about a couple of key features and then I'll get to how we do it. Sure. <laughs> if you want to ask that, just pop that on my mouth. I appreciate it. You're, you're great. Um, key features, um, each config page has an edit and view permission. So you can say, you know, some config pages are open to a large number of, like, like a large number of roles and some config pages are open to maybe only one or two people who have a specialized role. Maybe you don't want all of your all of your node creators to be able to edit the mailing list form. Maybe you only want your super user who's in charge of sending the email to be able to manage that form. So that's fine. And then there are global permissions like administer config pages, delete, edit all, delete all. So you can 
um, you can you can segment the permissions just like you would expect. Um, the config pages loader service is what does all of the work. Um, I, it is a really simple service. If you take 30 seconds to think about what you think the service might be, that's what it is. It is a very fancy wrapper around just an entity loader. Um, there are three services, uh, or, so there are three methods on the service. Uh, the load method just loads your entity. You pass in the machine name of your config page and it loads your entity and then you use the entity values how you expect. Um, the get value is sort of a, a helper method to just, if you know the machine name of your config page and the machine name of the field on the config page, um, you can skip the step of loading the entity and then just use get value. And then get field view is if you want a renderable array of the field. Um, because if, a lot of, if you're using the config page in order to display content, then in your pre-process function, um, you just go straight to get field view and um, you're great. So, uh, your general workflow, your web developers create your config page bundle, you commit it uh, to your code base, um, and then you use the config page's value elsewhere in your code, and your content editors can update the config values whenever they want, and you don't have to know about it. Um, a lot of this, a, a lot of this is, um, a lot of this talk is um, born out of the fact that I got frustrating changing our hard-coded values or overriding config. So maybe I'm the only one with that problem, but it's important to me. Um, so let's talk about our scenario for updating our email list. Um, so uh, we have, we just do it in a config page. Um, you know, our business process owner, they get the right permission. They when the employee leaves, they remove the email address. When the new employee takes their place, they get added to the email list. Uh, the web development team doesn't need to know anything about it. Um, the web development team doesn't need to write the form. The web development team doesn't need to set the configuration. Uh, we don't need to write the submit handler. That's not another file we have to maintain. Um, I always, I, the more files you create, the more classes you create as a developer, that's you know more things you have to pay attention to, that's more things you have to test. Um, and so the fact that you don't have to do this is great. Um, so this is, um, so I'm gonna walk you through like a sort of a pretty normal snippet from a, a hook mail alter. Um, so this is sort of our bad solution. You know, we're setting our blind copies to the email addresses and if someone needs to change something, that's a code change, you have to commit it, you have to QA it, you have to deploy it, you have to groom the ticket, you have to um, do all the things that you have to do, and sort of that's annoying. Um, but with our, um, this is a little more verbose code, but again, it's, it's, it's less overhead maintaining it. Um, but this is using our config page service. Um, this is very normal Drupal. Uh, your, your config page loader service you get from the service container, um, and you just load your entity, you grab your field value, and you put it in your, um, you put it in your BCC field, for example. Um, just super easy. Um, so this is how you might change that code. Um, and then if you want to use that get value method, instead of loading the entity and getting the values from the field, you can just use the, the, the get value method. Um, and again, you and because you implemented it this way, um, you're not going to get those tickets in your ticketing system. Um, again, technically not a very interesting solution, but from a workflow perspective, it just saves a lot of everyone a lot of time. Um, so this is sort of, I, I think a lot of people use uh, config pages uh, to render content, but I did want to make sure to show an example where we actually use it for like a business process. Is that a question? Um, yeah, so you're, generally speaking, are, is someone more technical building, building out the config page uh, bundle, mm -hmm. right? Like, like I'm, I'm asking because like in that previous uh, code snippet, um, you wouldn't want someone who uh, who's you know probably not technical to modify the config page uh, bundle because if they do and they change that field value like the field email now your code's going to break right because they've modified the 
config page, but they're only modifying like the values in the config page, right? Yeah, so the question, so a two-part question. The question is um, who's setting up the bundle and um, the subsequent code, and then if you're not changing the bundle, what are you doing? Um, so yes, I would recommend having your web development team set up the bundle, um, just for the reason that you mentioned, because if someone with permission to add or delete fields adds or delete a field, then your machine names break and your code breaks. Uh, so that's a very good solution. That's a very good point. And the, your client or your business process owner or your content editor or whatever you call them, the only thing they're doing is they're just changing the field values. Um, it's, yeah, it's a good point. Um, cool. Um, so let's talk about our other scenario for like a one-off page. Um, you know, you can give a, a user with an appropriate role, home page editor, for example, um, you can let them edit the, the config page feel and it'll feel like they're editing a node. They might not know that they're not editing a node because it's just an entity edit form that's fielded. Um, and we know that there's a lot of really powerful things we can do in a content editing form. If they want to drastically change the appearance of the home page, um, they don't need to ask you, we need to drastically change the appearance of our home page. They can just, you know, get different paragraphs that look fancier and drag them in a different order, and all of a sudden the home page looks very different from their perspective, but from your perspective, you just care that they're, I mean, it, the content uh, system knows that they're rearranging paragraphs. Um, no config needs to be exported. Um, as the developer, you're not gonna get a call because, uh, you're, not, you're not gonna get like an emergency call, an emergency ticket because someone accidentally deleted or unpublished the homepage node. Um, so that's, you know, great. Um, we know how to create powerful content editing experiences and now we know how to not get emergency calls because someone deleted our singleton node. Um, rendering this content is, again, simple. This is the entire controller for our home page minus the construct method. Um, you know, we inject the config pages loader service into our, um, um, you know, our controller, and then we just render our field. In my home page, uh, so in my home page example, um, you know, config page, I have a field called home page content. Um, no, no, I have, a, I, have a, I have a config page called home page content. I have a field called field paragraphs, um, and I'm just, viewing, um, I'm, I'm just viewing that. I'm not even using that helper method from the service itself. I'm just calling view on the field itself, and it renders it, and it behaves just like any piece of um, content. Um, so again, super duper easy, feels like a node, can't accidentally be, be deleted. Um, so how Bryn Mawr uses it, um, I've mentioned it a couple of times. Um, we have that um, update email list um, so that you know people don't have to change their email list. We don't actually have singleton uh, pages, but we do have singleton block uh, blocks and that we want content editors to be able to edit. And rather than create a block type, we just create a config page and grab those values into the block. and. Uh, that way we don't have to worry about them deleting their only instance of the block type or creating new instances of the block type. Uh, we also don't have to worry about ourselves doing that in case we forget it. Um, we maintain some of our image assets that we don't want to maintain as media entities because people with, um, you know, add, update, delete, media, we don't want to set up a new, you know, media type for um, please don't delete this media entity, you know, media type. Um, we don't have to create that. Um, and we don't have to worry about you know media going through the um, the wrong way. We use this for contextual instructions for node edit forms. We have uh, because we're a college, um, our workflow changes throughout the year. During the academic year, um, when um, people in the community, when when content editors, when anonymous users even submit events or they submit announcements or they submit other kinds of nodes um, to be reviewed and eventually published and they go through a moderation state. During the academic year, um, that moderation workflow happens every day. Um, during the summer when students are gone and everyone's on vacation, that 
moderation workflow might happen once every two weeks. And we want to have a message at the top of the node form that says, you know, we will get to your submission within 24 hours, or we will get to your submission sometime this month, who knows. Um, and, you know, if we, we don't want to create a singleton block type or we don't want to create a content block and then have to place it because that's config. Um, if someone accidentally deletes the block, uh, we don't want to have to figure out you know, the correct path to just get it on the node edit form. Um, we just have a config page that's like, what's the top message that describes your editorial workflow at the top of your announcements submit node edit form? And when our communications office are reviewing things every day, they can say, we're reviewing things every day. And then when, this is, then when it's the summer and they're doing it once every other week, they'll say, we will review this once every other week. And that's not a change request that we have to even be aware of. You know, if we were just like doing a, uh, if we were just doing a form alter and uh, hard coding that message, we would have to go in and change and redeploy every time that message needs to change. Now we just don't have to do that. Um, we use this for HTTP exception redirects, which is my favorite application of the tool. Um, and this is a little weird. Um, so we have this form. We migrated a lot of content a while ago uh, when we first launched the site. And when we migrated the content, all of our um, aliases changed because we had a different, um, we had a different information architecture and that caused a lot of things to break uh, because we didn't necessarily set up the, the redirects correctly or there were so many redirects or there were cases we weren't aware of and we did the migration, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we had to figure out what do we do when we have all, and so we had a, what do we do with all of these um, broken you know, 404s that consistently follow the, pa the, the path alias of a pattern related to our old information architecture, what can we do in our new architecture? So for example, um, you know, I've got, if, if someone is trying to go to an old news web page and at 404s, we can just send them to the slash news page. Um, and we have several examples of this. This is just the one. Um, but this is a config page. This is a pair, within the config page, we have a paragraph bundle with two text fields. One is our regex match and one is our redirect path. And in our um, event subscriber, um, this is our method for handling 404s. Um, we say, and this, this is a subscriber to any um, HTTP exception, if the HTTP, HTTP exception is a 404, um, we load our config page, um, and then we get our values from the config page. Um, our field is called field CP regex redirect. Um, we grab the paragraph entities, we loop through the paragraph entities, and we say if the requested path, that 404s, is a regex match to the pattern in our paragraph entity, redirect them to the redirect path we provide to our um, you know, redirect entity. And that way, when we, when we discover there is a new um, you know, path that's causing a lot of 404s and we can come up with a regex to do it, we don't need to deploy new code. We just go into our config page, we create a new paragraph bundle, we type in our regex pattern, we type in our redirect, uh, where we want that regex pattern to redirect to. It's not a deployment. It doesn't have to go, it, I mean, we, we groom a ticket for that because it's a complicated enough configuration page that maybe we want to. Um, but it's, it, it cuts down a lot on the overhead. This is probably my favorite application of the um, config page because you know, we're using it to handle regex, you know, redirects on HTTP exceptions. Um, other parts that I didn't get to, um, you can place config pages as blocks. In, so if you all have a singleton block rather than um, creating a block type for your singleton block, you can just place a regex um, you can just place a config page as um, a block. And since these are entities, they get different display modes. So you can place your config page in two different places as a block with two different display modes. That's kind of cool. 
Um, config pages are entities, and so if you ever need to reference them in an entity reference field, you can. I don't know why, but it's possible. Um, config pages, they even have a twip function that you can use. So if you don't want to you know, pre-process your render array or pre-process your page, just go to your twig file. Um, it gives you the config, page, config pages field function. You just give it the machine name of your config page, the machine name of your field, and the machine name of your display mode, and you get the render array. Um, or if you're, you'd like to do it the old-fashioned way with your pre-process functions or your form alters, you can do it like I demonstrated or discussed. Um, you can even expose your config page values as tokens. I haven't found a use case for this, but the possibility is there, so I assume someone has. Um, it's just really convenient, all the stuff that you can do with this. Um, I want to talk about a few cases where you might not want to use config pages. Um, you need moderation and revisionability. Um, these are content entities, not editorial content entities, so they don't get, uh, you can't put them through a workflow. Um, I don't think you can. Um, I might be wrong, but I don't think I am. And you can't you know, track a revision history. So if you need revisionability, config pages maybe not the solution. Um, if you want to actually track some of your data changes as, you know, with Drush config export and with Drush config import, um, nothing that happens in a config page gets exported and imported. So if you want those things, then um, you should write your own form. Um, if you don't have, you know, complex workflow or display needs, like if you're base, if you don't have singleton pages, for example, then you don't need a solution for singleton pages. Um, or if you don't have these kinds of email lists that need to get updated or any other, you know, we, this is a really helpful way of sort of managing our more complex workflows. If you don't have those, you don't need this. Um, if you're already using the config ignore module and you like the config ignore module, um, you don't um, need config pages because what the config ignore module does is it says take these configuration um, forms, the YAML that they would export, the YAML that you would import into these config pages forms, just don't do that. Um, so it's sort of, it, it, it still solves this problem of developers needing to pay attention to things that they don't want to pay attention to. Config ignore still solves the problem of not accidentally overwriting something. Um, it just does it by um, putting a stop to the normal configuration um, system within Drupal um, rather than, um, so what config pages does is it turns configuration into content. What, configura what config ignore does is um, it just turns off the configuration system for certain pieces of configuration. I don't like the config ignore module, that's why I prefer the config pages module. Um, I believe that's my last slide. Um, any questions? Yeah. I have a good example for you from the tokens. Go for it, Mike. So uh, I have a site where um, it's, a, it's a company that sells to say widgets, mm -hmm. and they're within an OSHA certified, or they have some certification where every year they have to post in several places a PDF showing their certification, not, and, the, and the filing has to be versioned and everything. So um, there is a config page specifically for the URL to that PDF because it changes every year, and then we utilize a config page token inside of WYSIWYG in a number of places so that we don't have to go hunting down all of the locations of that of that link or that file name. We can just refer to the token and only change it in one place. Right. So just to, oh, so thank you for that. So just to repeat. Um, right, good luck. Repeat yeah. <laughs> um, so just to repeat, uh, when we need to refer to a, a path to a file in multiple places throughout a site, um, we keep the path in the in a config page and export the path as a token. Um, I think that's what. Yeah, you, can that, you can use that token in WYSIWYG or, you know, oh. There you go. I, I, I never thought of a use case until, that, until you said that. That's great. Thank you. Yes? It's, it seems like this can be, it's being used in such a variety of ways. It seems like it's very similar to the WordPress's uh, advanced custom field. Um, it seems similar to WordPress's advanced custom fields. I'm, I'm not super familiar. As, 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 as far as how it's being flexed in different ways and 
in ways that it's, it seems like you're uh, you're needing to to uh, code your own modules in, in which you're it, that that's uh, things that are your your main you're needing to maintain on your own as opposed to uh, some some of the stuff that uh, could be community supported that you're using this model. Yeah, we so yeah so the observation is that we're using it for a lot of um, things that we that are like bespoke to our own site, and that's absolutely correct. I'm, I'm not, not super familiar with WordPress, so if other people are familiar, does that comparison resonate? Um, if not, that's cool. Um, if if so, I, I assume it does. I'm just not familiar with WordPress, but yes, it's like whenever whenever I get a a use case that I doubt there's something in the community for because it's pretty bespoke to a specific workflow. I don't even look very hard in contrib. I just assume that config page needs to be there. Um, it, but you're right, it's an incredible, it's a, it's a flexible tool that really um, helps custom development. You're absolutely right. Yes? Yeah, uh, first, thanks for introduction to this tool. It's the first time I've seen it, so uh, thank you for that. Um, we often uh, write a lot of custom Mm -hmm. Or upstream, and so occasionally this will provide us to the downstream so that we can insert their own things, like email address. And occasionally we need to programmatically set default or change a value in the field downstream. And so what we normally do is we'll load the YAML file, change it, take it back. You, um, so with this solution, there's no YAML file that's exported. Is there a way to programmatically update the value of the the, the, the field that you're uh, that's in your form? Yeah, so the question is, uh, given that there's no YAML, is there a way to programmatically update the value? Um, since it's an entity, I haven't, I haven't actually done this, but it's my assumption that because it's an entity, you know, any hook update, any hook post update. Yeah, hook post update. Yeah, I, I would assume, because this is an entity, um, I can't think of a reason a, host, a hook post update wouldn't work. So you would just load the entity and save the field value back? Yep. Basically. Yeah, because it's, it's a vanilla content entity. Okay. Yep. Yeah, just wanted to make sure that it's proper. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your um, attention. I'm around all mm -hmm. afternoon. Um, if you're tired of getting annoying uh, change requests and tickets um, and you would like to get fewer of them, uh, consider the config pages module. Thank you.